Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tenement Museum's book talk featuring the Great Kosher Meat War of 1902, Immigrant Housewives and the Riots that Shook New York City. I'm Dave Favaloro, Senior Director of Curatorial Affairs, and I'm glad to be with you virtually this evening. Thanks for tuning in. Before we get started, if you're watching this event live, you can ask questions and add comments for our speaker tonight throughout the event and throughout the talk, uh, but we'll also have dedicated time at the end for answering your questions. Feel free again to ask throughout the event. If you're not familiar with the Tenement Museum, we're a museum that tells the stories of immigrants, migrants and refugees in the United States, and we're a history museum located on New York's Lower East Side. One of those stories that we tell on our shop life tour and some of our other programs uh, is that of the Lustgarten family, Austrian Jewish immigrants who operated a kosher butcher shop and lived at the museum's 97 Orchard Street tenement from 1890 to 1902, were directly impacted by the historical events that our speaker this evening and the book uh, that we're going to be delving into uh, explores in great detail. So of course, we're very, very excited to be speaking this evening with author and historian Scott Seligman about his new book, The Kosher Meat War of 1902, uh, really the first book length treatment uh, of this subject. Uh, before we get started, please be aware that The Great Kosher Meat War of 1902 will be available for sale on the Tenement Museum website via our online shop and a link will be provided in the chat for ease of access. Uh, but without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you formally to our speaker this evening. Scott D. Seligman is an award-winning writer, historian, genealogist, and former corporate executive who holds an undergraduate degree in American history from Princeton University and a master's degree from Harvard. He spent much of his career in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China, uh, is fluent in Mandarin, and reads and writes Chinese. He has worked as a legislative assistant to a member of the US Congress, lobbied the Chinese government on behalf of American business, managed a multinational public relations agency in China, served as spokesperson and communications director for a Fortune 50 company and taught English in Taiwan and Chinese in Washington, DC. His last book, The Third Degree, The Triple Murder That Shook Washington and Changed American Criminal Justice, won the gold medal award in history in the 2019 Independent Publisher 2019 Book Awards. And The Great Kosher Meat War of 1902, his first Jewish theme book was just named a finalist in the 2020 National Jewish Book Awards uh, a week and a half ago uh, from today. So uh, quite a um, uh, you know, list of uh, accomplishments and, and uh, diverse background uh, you bring to this work, Scott. So we're excited to have you with us tonight, welcome. And the excitement is mutual. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I, first of all, let me say thank you to Dave, to um, Arabella Friedland, um, Mary Kate Cowell, and Selena Kelly, all of whom have been helpful to me at one point or another in the preparation of this book. Um, but I was especially pleased to be asked to give the presentation under the museum's auspices because first of all, I got some help from the museum when I was creating the work. And also because as Dave mentioned, some of the action in the book actually takes place at 97 Orchard Street. Um, where the museum is located. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I did want to note that um, although there isn't much good you can say about a pandemic and, and nobody hopes this one will be behind us as soon as I will, um, one small upside has actually been the explosion of um, online events. And thanks to Zoom, I can speak with you today from Washington DC where I live. Uh, I didn't have to travel anywhere and you don't have to wear a mask. Um, so there, there are, there's, a, I suppose, some, something of a silver lining. I'll talk for about 20 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, and then I'll be very glad to take questions. Um, so let me um, get this uh, set up now with my, um, uh, with my slides. Give me just one second here to share the screen. Great. Um, share this and... How's that? Can you see the slide? Excellent. Yes, technology okay, has cooperated with you, no, so we're <laughs> it doesn't we're all... good. Well, Off if you've ever if you've ever read anything that um, that I've written in the past, chances are it was something to do with China, the Chinese people, or the Chinese language. Um, and uh, this is actually my first um, Jewish book. Um, 
uh, so, but so it, this is the book that's not like the others. Um, and um, what happened to the last one? Okay, technology is not cooperating here. Go on. There you go. Here we go. Okay. Um, in addition to being a uh, Jewish genealogist, I've created several websites and done some, uh, some of my family history, which is one of the reasons I got interested in this. And I've written a couple of articles about American Jewish history for the foreword. One of them, in fact, this one that I'm showing you on the slide now, was about a fundraiser um, put on by the Chinese in Manhattan in 1903, which is just a year after this book takes place, for Jewish victims of a Russian pogrom. I'll let you think about the title for a minute, The Night New York's Chinese Went Out for Jews. Not everybody gets it immediately. Um, but I was already interested in the Lower East Side experience because some of my own forebears lived there. But the research for this article got me a little bit more focused on the Jewish experience there. And that kind of led me to getting interested in this topic. Um, the genesis of this particular work was an article that appeared in a journal called American Jewish History uh, in 1980, so it's 40 years ago, by the late Dr. Paula Hyman, who was a professor of modern Jewish history at Yale. She's really the one who deserves the credit for, I guess, exhuming this story. She was the first woman to uh, head a um, Jewish studies program at a major university. And I think it was her interest in feminism, actually, that led her to look at the origins of activism among uh, Jewish women in America. And she really is the one who deserves credit for rescuing this story. And the, and the main narrative of the book, which we'll get to in a minute, is it concerns basically concerns Orthodox Jewish women who took to the streets in 1902 to protest the rising prices of kosher meat that put it out of the reach of many families. And I found this story sort of mostly uneducated immigrant wives and mothers who faced a common threat and discovered their collective power as consumers um, to be a very inspiring story. So I decided I wanted to look further into it. My own maternal grandmother was living on Orchard Street at the time. Um, she was just 10 years old, but her mother, my great-grandmother, very likely participated in this boycott. Um, but I did the math yesterday and um, she would be 159 today if she were still around. And unfortunately, that's a little too old to ask her. Um, so I just have to speculate on that. I wanted to read further on the topic, but what I discovered was that nobody since Dr. Hyman had dug any more deeply than she had on it. And that was 40 years ago, and she left us only 14 pages about it. So I decided to do some investigating of my own. And fortunately for me, I had some tools available that were not available to her in 1980. Um, a lot of it, a lot of my research was uh, through newspapers. Um, in the four decades since she did her research, um, many, many old newspapers um, have now become available online and um, more to the point, through the magic of optical character recognition are now keyword searchable. So you can do research now that was virtually impossible just maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Even if you were hunched over a microfilm reader, you wouldn't have been able to do keyword search and it wouldn't have been able to be as precise. And you, you wouldn't be able to find things that you weren't actually looking for. The beauty of this, uh, and, and all the New York papers are now online on one website or another, uh, the Times, the Herald, the Tribune, the Sun, the New York World, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, the Brooklyn Standard Union, and not to mention others that were not New York papers, because this was actually a national story. It wasn't just a New York story, like the Boston Globe, the St. Louis Republic, the Washington Post. Um, they're all online and they're all searchable. And before I was done with this, I think I had at least 2,000 articles to work from, from the English language press. Um, in addition to this, I was also able to use um, the tools of genealogical research to, in order to do a little investigating about the women who were behind the boycott. And in that case, I went to census records. Um, I went to uh, uh, ship passenger records, manifests, naturalization records, passport records, um, vital records. Uh, I looked at obituaries for where I could find them. Uh, even occasionally a gravestone, which uh, helped me with a date or two. And um, I was also able to use these tools to locate and contact descendants of um, some of the women who had organized the boycott. And that was also very rewarding. And then there was the Yiddish press. Yiddish is unfortunately not one of my languages. 
And I was fortunate that um, Rivka Schiller in New York City helped me search for articles. And uh, Dr. Miriam Isaacs, who is, uh, lives down here in Washington near me, she used to teach um, Yiddish at the University of Maryland. She uh, sat with me um, patiently as we went through several dozen of the articles that had appeared in the Yiddish press and, uh, and gave me simultaneous translation as I took copious notes. Uh, there were actually three Yiddish papers uh, that survived for the period that reported on this. The foreword was one of them uh, and the Arbeiter Zeitung, though two of them were socialist papers. But there was also the Tageblatt, which was an orthodox paper. And we found these at YIVO, at the Institute for Jew the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, which is at the Center for Jewish History. Um, and, um, and they were, they gave a whole different perspective, basically the Jewish community perspective on what was going on. Now, since I was researching a book and not an article, I had the luxury of asking a few questions that Dr. Hyman didn't have room for. Like, for example, why did prices go up? Who was responsible for that? Why did it happen? And was it specifically aimed at the Jewish community? The women blamed their retail butchers for the problem. But the principal culprits I discovered were actually hundreds of miles away. Um, so let me begin by talking about them. I wanna talk about the source of the problem, why the prices went up, and then I'll cut to the women and the strike. Now you gotta go back with me. This is the turn of the 20th century. It's the era of the trusts. Um, you probably heard of the Standard Oil Trust, the Railroad Trust, the Steel Trust. Well, it turns out there was such a thing as the Beef Trust sometimes referred to as the meat trust. And this was based in Chicago. Uh, men like Swift and Armour, which are names you probably know from the supermarket even today. These men were conspiring to corner the American market for meat. And they did it in a lot of different ways. They pressured cattlemen from the West to sell at a lead lower prices. They uh, pressured the railroads to give them kickbacks to use them for transportation. They controlled the supply of meat that was sent to the cities. And most of the big markets were still on the East Coast at this point. Um, and ultimately gouging consumers because that's where the ultimate money was coming from. So although the price of all meat went up all around the country, observant Jews were actually hit the hardest. And I'll tell you why. We all know that kosher meat is more expensive. It's always been more expensive than, um, than non-kosher meat. And that's because, as I have always grew up understanding it, because there were slaughterers and supervisors, um, shochtim and mashkichim in, in Hebrew, um, who needed to be paid for their efforts because um, kosher meat had to be slaughtered under very strict con conditions that are very specifically spe specified in the Bible and in the Talmud. But it turns out that in 1902, there were other factors as well. Um, and, and it goes back to the 1890s, sorry, the 1880s, I think, when they invented the refrigerator car. Um, before that, um, meat was local. Um, you, you would, you would um, uh, the slaughtering of meat was local, excuse me. Um, there were slaughterhouses in all major cities and they did the slaughtering of the meat, um, some of them for kosher markets, some of them not. But the invention of the refrigerator car in the 1870s was a game changer for the meat industry. What it meant was that they could actually slaughter meat in one city and sell it in another one. And the reason that that was economical was what you're looking at in this slide here. This is a refrigerator car and you can see how many carcasses you can get into, a, into, a, um, uh, into one railroad car. Previous to that, the cows had to come in from, um, the, uh, from the Midwest to New York on the hoof, um, which is to say as live animals and they would be slaughtered locally in New York City. So this saved a great deal of money and, and, and made meat a lot cheaper. Um, the problem was that, oh, and also a lot of slaughterhouses closed down in New York when this happened because um, it was more economical to centralize the whole process in, uh, in the Midwest. The exception to this rule was the Jewish community. Um, Jewish, uh, for, the, for the Orthodox Jewish community, the meat had to be slaughtered locally. Jewish law forbids the consumption of meat that has not been, the word is kosher, it's related to the word for kosher. And what that meant was soaked and salted in particular um, within 72 hours of slaughter. This is a process that essentially drains the blood out of the meat because it's forbidden to eat the lifeblood of the animal. And um, as I confirmed with my two aging aunts, um, this is something that was done in the home back at the turn of the century. So you simply couldn't get meat from Chicago to 
your, your kitchen in 72 hours. And therefore the meat that was consumed by the Jewish community had to come in on the hoof. And that meant a lot fewer cattle per car. It meant uh, that they had to absorb the costs of cows that lost weight or died on the, in the, on, the, on the journey. And it was basically more expensive. So even before anything happened, the Jews are paying a great deal more for their meat than everybody else is. Um, when the meat, uh, oh, and then there's the other, the other part um, of this was that um, typically only the uh, four quarters of the cow are sold as kosher meat. And this is, uh, this actually uh, is, a, is a biblical proscription against, um, uh, it goes back to the story of Jacob and the um, uh, wrestling with an angel of God and his, uh, he injured his sciatic nerve. And so there's certain nerves that are forbidden to eat. Uh, it's not that the, uh, the, the, the hindquarters of the cow could not be made kosher. In the old country, it sometimes was. But um, there are a lot more um, tendons and forbidden parts in the, in the hindquarters than the forequarters. And it's a pain to kind of um, extract them all. So what most slaughterhouses would do was just sell the forequarters to the kosher market and the hindquarters to the non-kosher market. So once the cattle arrived in New York, uh, most of it was held in pens in Jersey City. Uh, and then brought over by barge um, to uh, one of three major slaughterhouses in Manhattan at this point. One of them was on the Hudson River, and then two of these, which are, are shown in the picture, uh, were on the East River. Um, that's a Schwarzels and Sulzberger, and then United Dress Beef right next door to each other on the East River. Um, this uh, plot of land is uh, currently occupied by the United Nations, so I'll give you a sense of sort of where it is. And these, um, the slaughterhouses in New York were operated by Jews, but they were German Jews. They were by and large earlier arrivals uh, who had um, succeeded. They may have started out on the Lower East Side, but by this time they were living high on the hog in, uh, in Midtown. This is Ferdinand Sulzberger, he's one of them. Um, he, like the other uh, men in charge of these slaughterhouses, was Jewish, but not particularly observant. Uh, and there really was, if you know anything about this history, there was no love lost between the German Jews and the Eastern European and Russian Jews who came later. Um, and either, either direction. The, um, the Russian immigrants uh, looked at these guys, they, derived, they, they derided them as Hebrews with shaved beards, um, people who had gotten fat from eating non-kosher meat. They were, they were really quite um, um, dismissive of them. But these were the guys who were in charge of the slaughterhouses. And the condescension, of course, was mutual. Uh, the German Jews saw the Russians as bumpkins who were unassimilable and hence embarrassing and somewhat threatening to their own um, sense of, um, um, uh, of assimilation. So, um, and these were the guys who, the, who were in charge of getting the meat. This was the slaughterhouse and then they, they sold the meat to the retail butchers. And this is a retail butcher um, shop in, on the Lower East Side. The one that, we were, that uh, David was talking about on the, in the basement of 97 um, uh, or Orchard was, um, uh, was one of them like this. This one, the, the, that one was, um, was run by the Lust Garden family. But this isn't them, this is a different picture. And so the slaughterhouses sold meat to the, to the, um, to the local butchers. Um, and uh, when the um, wholesalers, excuse me, when the, when the um, meat processors, the meat packers in Chicago started to raise prices, they did it aggressively in early 1902. And within a matter of weeks, the retail price of a pound of kosher beef went up 50% from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound. Now that doesn't sound like a lot in our, from our standards today, but that's about maybe five and a quarter in today's dollars a pound. And uh, you have to remember that uh, these families were not making very much money. Uh, meat became unaffordable to Jewish families. Jewish families typically were making uh, if, if the, the typical Jewish family was a breadwinner, a male, the man who went out to was the breadwinner, the woman stayed home, ran the house. And um, the breadwinners made something like $2 a day. So maybe $10, maybe $12 um, a week was what all they brought home. And the extra six cents a pound was, was significant to these families. And of course, they couldn't. So they got to the point where a lot of them couldn't afford kosher meat, but buying non-kosher meat was unthinkable. So the... Um, and the precisely the same time that all of this is going on, um, just as New York's Jews are trying to figure out how they're gonna feed their families, the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, who was uh, known as the trust buster president, he didn't have any use for, um, for big business. Um, 
they were taking the beef trust to court because they were in violate, they believed they were in violation of the antitrust laws, the Sherman antitrust law, uh, which had been passed in the 1890s. And um, this lawsuit was the backdrop against which the, 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 the protests were happening in New York. Um, it took a lot longer than just the few weeks that the protests went on, but the case actually played out as a sort of a, it, it, the, the case actually went to the Supreme Court eventually. And eventually, um, uh, the rulings were against them and they had to break up the cartel. But that didn't happen until several years later. But now back to the main narrative, okay, the women's strike. When prices rose precipitously in 1902, the first people to realize that there was a huge problem were the retail butchers themselves because they knew that their, their um, customers were not gonna be able to absorb a 50% increase in prices and still buy from them. So they got together and they decided they would stage a boycott of the wholesalers that did, they did business with. And what they did was they closed their doors for four or five days. And at the time their customers, which were the, essentially the women of the Lower East Side, fully supported them in this. Everybody understood why they were doing it. People went without meat for a few days and uh, everybody was hopeful that this would be enough to bring prices down. And they did manage to get some minor concessions out of the slaughterhouses. But what, when they reopened, they actually began charging higher prices than they had before rather than lower ones, which is what everybody expected. And that was the, 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 the match that lit the tinderbox. Several women emerged from obscurity to oppose them. Now I wanna introduce you to these women, but my biggest disappointment in, uh, in writing this book was that I was unable to get any photographs of any of the women who organized this. And believe me, I tried. I contacted descendants, I looked under rocks, I looked at newspaper archives, they just don't exist. And the reason for that was that these were not well-known women. They weren't famous for anything in particular. But it doesn't stop me from painting a portrait of them. It's just that I can't actually show you what their faces look like. 1902 was a long time ago. The descendants couldn't come up with any pictures. They knew about the women. They knew their names, but nobody had any pictures. So first, let me introduce you to Sarah Edelson. She started the whole thing. Um, when she called on May 14th, 1902, she called a meeting at Monroe Palace, which was her family's saloon on Monroe Street that, soon that, that her husband owned um, to fight the rise in prices. And she expected about 50 people to show up, but 500 women showed up for her meeting and they spilled out onto Monroe Street. Sarah was a force of nature. She was a large woman. She weighed about 250 pounds, um, physically imposing. She had a booming voice, rang with authority. She was a natural leader and a born organizer. And Sarah had arrived in the US actually very early for a Russian Jewish immigrant, 1868, because the real wave of Russian Jewish immigration didn't really start to the early 1880s, but she was quite early. Um, she had married, she had already given birth to six children by the time of the, um, of the, um, of the strike. Um, and, um, but motherhood had never kept her homebound. She helped out at the store, at the bar. She helped manage, um, she also was, a, was a, what they called a shadchan or a matchmaker. So Sarah was making money here and there. Uh, she was a woman about the community. She never shrank from a fight. She was about 50 years old when, uh, when, when the action of the book takes place. Next was Carolyn Schatzberg. She was Austrian. Um, she had married in Austria. Uh, sorry, excuse me, she was Romanian. I'm, I'm wrong about that. She was Romanian. She emigrated in 1885. Um, at the time of the strike, she was 51. She, was a, she had just been widowed just a few months earlier. Um, but she was a woman of a little more means than the others. Uh, she actually had a servant living in her home, um, but she was happy to fight for people who were less fortunate than she was. Um, she would, she'd been in America for 18 years. She had really mastered English. She was almost eloquent in the language, as you can tell from the interview that they published with her, I think it was the New York World. Um, and she actually took over the leadership of the movement, but not without a struggle with Sarah Edelson, which the book goes into in a lot of detail. Uh, Paulina Finkel was a 32-year-old uh, mother of four. She had been in America for about a decade. Uh, it was she who placed the announcements in the Yiddish papers calling on the women of the Jewish quarter to take action. And she was actually a member of a team that went to the mayor's office uh, to get a demonstration permit, which was denied her, and also to ask that the police not interfere, which um, was also something that was denied because the police were really um, very much part of this thing and they were very abusive 
uh, to the women on the streets. The New York World called her the Napoleon of the East Side. I'm still trying to figure that one out. And finally, Sarah Cohn, 31 years old, she was a woman of boundless energy, tall, uh, blue-eyed, fair-haired. She, um, she was Austrian. Um, she uh, married a locksmith. She came to New York in 1894. She had a house full of children. The youngest was just two months old, but she still undertook to open um, the first cooperative butcher shop in New York, uh, which was toward the end of the boycott. But it was another woman named Fanny Levy, who was 35 years old, Russian born, mother of six, who gets credit in my book for the most quotable quote in the book. Um, after the local butchers reopened, having failed to make any headway um, with the wholesalers as far as prices were concerned, she was the one that called the women to take matters into their own hands. And the quote was, she's talking about the butchers. She said, this is their strike. She said, let the women make a strike, then there will be a strike. And um, she, um, in fact, I wanted to call the book, Let the Women Make a Strike. I thought that was a great type of title for a book, um, but the publisher didn't agree. And um, publishers usually uh, get to veto whatever's on the cover of a book. So I didn't win that battle. Um, anyway, um, so, so, so that was Fannie Levy. And she spent, she, this was at the first meeting at Monroe Palace that she said it. And here's Monroe Palace. Uh, courtesy of the Edelson family, I got this photograph. Sarah, unfortunately, is not in it, but several members of her family are. The two big men on either side of the, uh, the photo were both her sons. Uh, and then the rest of the people there were um, um, uh, workers, people who work at the saloon. So this meeting takes place the morning after the meeting, uh, in the wee hours of the night, some 3,000 people, mostly Jewish women, recruited that night by their peers they assembled in the pitch black in squads of five on every street in the Lower East Side where there was a kosher butcher shop. And when the stores opened at seven o'clock, they followed the instructions to wave off all potential buyers, explain to each one that if they worked together and did without meat for just a short period of time, prices would come down. Well, that's kind of the way they planned it. It's not the way it happened. The demonstrations were supposed to be nonviolent, but they didn't stay that way. Customers who insisted on patronizing the butchers were assaulted on their way out. Their purchases were grabbed from them, um, thrown into the gutter so they couldn't be eaten. Occasionally, they would even put kerosene on them so they could never be consumed. Sometimes they would reimburse the woman for the money. They would reach into their own purses and reimburse them with a the woman. But um, that didn't happen too often. Um, butchers who refused to close were attacked. Uh, their windows were smashed. Their stock was ruined. In many cases, their fixtures were destroyed. There were even some reports of arson. The police were summoned to the neighborhood by the hundreds, and they were vicious. They attacked the pickets with nightsticks. They sent many women to the hospitals and many more to, um, to jail. Um, and all of this goes on for three days. Uh, it starts on a Wednesday until Friday night, May 16th, which is the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath. And the street protests stopped dead in their tracks because it was the Sabbath. And these were very observant Orthodox women. So the whole next day, um, the women were not idle, um, but they decided that the Sabbath was their best opportunity to reach the men folk because the men worked during the week. Um, but most of them, again, if they were Orthodox, they were in the synagogues or in the what they call the Stiblach, which were the sort of the small worship halls. They were there on Saturday morning. So the women decided to divide up into teams of two and visit the Stiblach and visit the synagogues and see if they could address the congregation briefly and just tell them about the, the, uh, the, the, um, the boycott and why it was important. And two women in particular, um, we know today only as Mrs. Silver and Mrs. Kisilov. Unfortunately, their, their first names and their biographies are lost to history. I went through all the census records, but there were too many Silvers and Kisilovs to have identified exactly who they were. But they were, um, they were, they were a piece of work. Um, the, the, in most places, like the Beis HaMidrash Hagadol, which was the largest synagogue on the Lower East Side, in fact, it just burned down a few years ago. Uh, it's been around forever. It actually started out as a church and then became a synagogue, which I think explains the architecture. You can see it in the picture. Um, they were, they were basically received sympathetically in most of the places where they went. Um, Mrs. Silver had a Jewish education and she was very clever. She quoted Genesis with, with tears in her eyes. She used God's pronouncement when he was, God was talking to Adam, to Eve about Adam. 
and, uh, and he used the expression, and he shall rule over thee. And Mrs. Silver decided that that was a great line to use to appeal to the men, to use their God-given authority over their women folk to a good end and urge them to support the boycott. And apparently many men at the Beis HaMedrash HaGadol um, pledged to do just that. And then they visited the Eldridge Street Synagogue, which I'm sure some of you have probably visited as well. It's a beautiful facility. It's also on the Lower East Side. And Mrs. Silver asked the rabbi to lay a cherem on the meat, which uh, I didn't, not a word that I knew. It's a, it's a potent Yiddish term for a, a boycott that's something in the nature of a religious ban. And um, the, the rabbi was very frank with her. He said he was unwilling to do that because he feared the butchers would go after him if he did. But he did ask the worshipers to support the boycott. And it took some persuading, but he permitted the women to speak from the bima, which is the platform in the center of the synagogue from which the, the Torah is read, traditionally off limits to women. Um, and here they were taking advantage of a little used custom that dates at least as far back as the Middle Ages. Uh, the Hebrew for it is betul tamid, And what it essentially says is that in a matter of social justices or to seek redress of a wrong, it is permissible to interrupt worship services and even to interrupt the Torah service if necessary in order to uh, get justice. And so that's why the women were, um, were uh, able to do this. Um, things did not go so well at the Forsyth Street Synagogue. I don't have a picture of that one, but there a very vocal worshiper objected to women mounting the bima. He said it was chutzpah, which I don't think I have to define, um, and an insult to the Torah. But Mrs. Silver didn't miss a beat. She looked back at him and smiled beatifically and said, the Torah will forgive me. And uh, there was a big ruckus. Um, she and Mrs. Kisilov almost got arrested, but uh, cooler heads prevailed and that didn't happen. So um, the next day, um, they, they had a meeting and the women established the Ladies Anti-Beef Trust Association in order to lead the boycott. Uh, among other things, it printed and distributed Yiddish language circulars in the tenements to try to build support for the boycott so people understood what was going on and that they would be patient and continue to support um, not buying meat. One of the, one of the circulars was, read something like, eat no meat while the trust is taking the meat from the bones of your women and children. It was very graphic. And the Ladies Anti-Beef Trust Association also recruited women from outside Manhattan um, also reached out to various synagogues and benevolent societies and lodges in the Jewish quarter in order to build support for the boycott. And over the next week, it spread to Brooklyn, to the Bronx, to Harlem, to Newark, and even as far as Boston. Well, the next day was Monday, they were back on the streets and the demonstrations continued for several days until all the butcher shops had closed. This is an illustration from the front page of the foreword. Um, shows a Jewish man being crushed by a joint effort of the meat trust, which is represented by the steer on the left, and what they called the kosher meat trust, which was symbolized by a slaughterer on the right. So they were, um, they were already aiming at the um, local slaughterhouses as well with this. One of the things that struck me that was very interesting was how the blame game played out. Everybody placed blame on whoever was one step earlier than they were in the supply chain. So we start with the women who blamed their own butchers for the rise in prices. And the butchers blamed the, um, uh, and, th and there's their own butchers. This is actually Israel Lustgarden uh, who, from 97 Orchard Street. That's a picture of him. The butchers like Lustgarden blamed the German Jewish run slaughterhouse operators who claimed that they were powerless to set prices that they really should be talking to the uh, meat packers back in Chicago who in turn said, don't blame us. There are fewer cattle because of the cattlemen out west. They're the real source of the problem. Well, in fact, it was the meat packers who were mostly responsible for manipulating the prices, even though they denied it. But the local scene in New York, it pitted uh, Jew against Jew. It was housewives against butchers, butchers against wholesalers, the secular against the Orthodox, the Eastern European against the Germans. And it also exacerbated other frictions like those between the Jews and the police. Um, so before long, every kosher butcher shop on the Lower East Side had either closed its doors or had its doors closed for them. And the newspapers were sympathetic with the demonstrators, at least up to a point. 
The forward, the socialist paper, was an unabashed cheerleader for the women. That headline reads, Brava, Brava, Yiddish, uh, Jewish women. Uh, they couldn't see anything wrong with it. They didn't see any violence. They didn't see people past smashing windows. They just saw heroic women standing up against uh, the evil capitalists. That's a, they, they, were, they were cheerleaders. Um, the New York World compared the whole affair to the Boston Tea Party. Um, it, was, it, asserted, it asserted it was impossible not to feel sympathy for these East Side housewives. So especially at the beginning on the editorial pages of these papers, there was a lot of sympathy for the women because people understood that their backs were up against the wall. Not so the New York Times. It will not do to have a swarm of ignorant and infuriated women going about any part of the city with petroleum, destroying goods and trying to set fire to the shops of those against whom they're angry. Now remember, the Times is owned by German Jews, and it didn't need much persuading to condemn the protesters. It called them ignorant, it referred to them as a dangerous class who, quote, do not understand the duties or the rights of Americans. Well, it was probably inevitable that some control over the strike was eventually gonna pass into the hands of men. Um, after all, to build support for the movement, the women had to reach out to many male-dominated organizations, which was most organizations, of the Jewish community on the Lower East Side at the turn of the century. And it did not sit well with their men folk to see their women clubbed in the streets and thrown into jail. That was something that um, you just didn't do to women in 1902. Um, and it was also, it was the men who had the most experience in handling um, contentious situations that transcended the Jewish community. Men like Dr. David Blaustein, um, who was the superintendent of what they called the Educational Alliance, still exists a settlement house that was set up by, um, by German Jews to Americanize their Eastern European uh, brethren so they wouldn't be such an embarrassment. Um, Blaustein was uh, not himself observant, but um, he, um, he uh, was very sympathetic with people who were and was, was very well um, regarded in the community. And then Joseph Barandis was a labor activist. These two men became part of the leadership and soon a larger coalition was formed um, of which the Ladies Anti-Beef Trust Association was just one member. They called it the Allied Conference for Cheap Kosher Meat. And the new name made no reference to women because by the time, was, the, time the strike was ended, it was more or less male dominate, a male-dominated committee that was calling the shots. But interestingly, it does not appear as if the women objected to this appropriation of power. This was not a feminist movement in the sense that it was not about a, a, um, getting more power for women. It was about getting cheaper prices for kosher meat. And to the extent that the men agreed with that and fought with the women to get that, there was really no, um, no sense that, uh, that they weren't all playing on the same team. Well, how the boycott ended was complicated. Um, it was sort of with more of a whimper than a bang. You can read the book for how it wound down, but suffice it to say that there were lengthy negotiations with the wholesalers, the rabbis were brought in, um, and the slaughterhouses and the meat packers ultimately gave in. After all, the goal had been to raise profits and with nobody buying meat, there weren't any profits. So it clearly was a strategy that had backfired and they were willing to basically backtrack, at least for a while. And so you have to say that the strike was a success, but it was a limited one because there was no agreement to keep prices down forever, just to keep them down for the moment. And sure enough, um, prices rose again in 1908 they rose again in 1917 and again during the depression. And there were demonstrations each time hit the streets, but none of them on the scale of the 1902 boycott. What I found most compelling about this, I think, was, that the, was the fact that without prior experience with minimal resources, these women managed to organize themselves virtually overnight into a powerful fighting force that took on and basically bested uh, well-funded uh, corporate interests. And they have, these are women who emerged from obscurity and they sank right back into obscurity when it was all over. But they were trailblazers. This was the vanguard of homemaker organized Jewish activism in America. This is what, this is what it was. The same strategies were used in 1904 in the rent strikes that took place. Um, and again in 1908. And the 1902 meat strike was explicitly called out as a precedent. Tactics like leafleting, street meetings, other forms of community organizing were copied and used to good effect. 
These, interestingly enough, the tenant strikes were also female led, but it was an entirely different cast of characters. Not one of the women who was involved in the meat strike was also involved in the tenant strike. And I think you can argue that after the great kosher meat war was over, immigrant Jewish women didn't need any more persuading if they ever did that they were capable of uniting and affecting change in, in the, their new homeland. And the same strategies you saw, the spirit and the, the grassroots tactics would be applied in suffrage demonstrations, labor actions, and well into the century. Their struggle was not long remembered. I didn't find references to it much after the 1920s. But I think that their influence can be felt, if only indirectly, whenever consumers unite you know, to protest a, a corporate policy or a lapse in ethical behavior or just a rise in prices. So I think that later movements in the 20th and even the 21st century really owe a great deal to this strike, even though they might not, the, the leaders might not have known that it had happened. Well, let me stop there. Um, this isn't a traditional book talk, so I can't exactly sit down and sign copies of the book. Um, but I can tell you that it's available um, through the Tenement Museum. And also that um, what authors are doing in the pandemic for people who want signed copies of the book is um, uh, authors are giving them labels. So if any of you wanna buy the book and you would like a signature, um, write to me through the book's website, greatkoshermeatwar.com. And I will be very happy to mail you a label that you can affix into the book. Now, I've, if uh, I would be very happy to answer questions, let me unshare the uh, screen here. Great, thank you so much, Scott. That was um, that was really really wonderful. And if it's any um, consolation, I prefer uh, your title, <laughs> your yeah, original title. For, <laughs> for one one of the things I now. learned is that um, um, authors are responsible for what's between the covers. Publishers get to say what's on the covers. So you lose some, you win some, you know? <laughs> For better or worse, fair, fair enough. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I think that really comes through in your, um, in your talk, um, and I wanted to start with a, a few questions while we wait for, um, you know, viewers to, uh, to submit some uh, mm -hmm. here that we could, we could sort of uh, pose and, and uh, discuss and wrestle with. Uh, I had a couple of things that I think were, really coming to mind for me as I both listened to your talk and, and, and read the book. Uh, I think one of the things that really comes through, I think clearly through the presentation and, and, and through the book is, um, uh, is really like your approach to telling the story. And in fact, um, in the book, uh, you sort of list the dramatis personae, right? And so, you know, I think that really um, in the book, uh, foreshadows, uh, you know, what's to come. And so I was curious to hear a little bit, you know, you could have approached telling the story in a, a number of different ways. Um, what, what sort of moved you to, to, to really have this kind of cast of characters in some ways, right? It's a book, it's a historical story, certainly, right? And, and the sources are mined, I think, um, uh, you know, in, in, in ways that you, you shared with us this evening. Uh, but certainly there are, um, you know, villains here, right? There mm -hmm. are, um, quote unquote heroes, maybe. Yeah, would you mind telling us a little bit about wh what your sure. thinking was and how you kind of put things together here? Well, what I, what I look for when I'm working on a book is a human story that has broader implications. I think that's what people like reading. They like reading about people. I'm not a, I'm not a big one for secondary sources that talk about grand, um, uh, uh, grand ideas that sort of float around. Uh, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not that abstract. Um, I tend to be fairly... Um, um, fairly rooted in the human experience. So I wanted to tell the story of these women, um, which actually turned out to be not a very easy thing to do because they didn't, not a, one of them left a memoir. Uh, again, they went into obscurity. Um, so it was, you know, all the, all the looking at documents and looking at city directories and all the other things to put together. Believe me, there is not a single fact about any of these women that is not in that book that I found. I used everything I could find. Um, but once you're looking at the world through their eyes, then uh, it, it raises questions about, it, 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 it unfolds by itself. Um, why did the price of kosher meat go up? Well, that's the first question. And then that leads you to a different kind of research. Uh, in fact, uh, as I started just, um, just doing uh, newspaper research about the strike, there were all these articles I thought were kind of extraneous about what was going on in the meat industry. And the more I read, the more I realized they weren't extraneous at all. They were the point, but, the, but nobody had been linking them specifically to what the women were doing. So that kind of moves you out into other 
sort of concentric circles, I guess. And you wind up talking about other issues that affected the women. But as much as you can from their perspective, from their lives, you know, what, what was it about their lives that made it all happen? Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the sort of um, takeaways for me uh, was the way, you know, the way in which I think, um, you know, this, this particular story, it's a very local one uh, set on the Lower East Side that had, uh, you know, local um, uh, impact uh, and so forth. Uh, but it really sort of brings in, you know, I think national uh, trends and forces from uh, from that period of the early 20th century, everything from the labor movement uh, to um, you know sort of the 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 trust uh, issues and reforming and policing those um, uh, to um, to the printed press, and I think that was a really nice to see the different uh, views mm -hmm. uh, of the printed press. And if we we just got a lot of questions from. Um, from viewers, I want to get to them, but if, if we have time, I'm really sort of interested in this idea that the, um, I believe it was the Evening World suggested link link, link the the uh, boycott uh, to the 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 Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party. So actually, you know, we get to that. We'll, you know, we'll, they, we'll... they weren't the only ones. They weren't the oh, only interesting. ones. The Forward did it as well, and so did the Brooklyn Standard Union. It occurred to a lot of people because of the similarities. These were it was a righteous struggle that may not have been fully legal but a righteous struggle by people who's, who felt that their backs were up against the wall. I thought it was a pretty nice analogy. If I could have worked that into the title of the book, I might have done it. Right, right. Yeah, interesting. Uh, interesting that um, so many different perspectives found it important to link it uh, to uh, an important event, a seminal event in, uh, event in the history of the uh, of the country and its and its founding, um, and and this was something really driven by um, you know a, a, a group of uh, of immigrant women who who you know arguably were only here uh, in the country for um, you know for several several years several decades maybe at most right great so yeah I want to want to make sure to get to some of um, some of these questions. Um, one of the questions is, you know, some of them are really specific and, and one viewer wants to know, were there specific cuts of meat that the families tended to choose on a regular basis? You were speaking a little bit to this with, with the specifics on, um, you know, kosher uh, slaughter and, and um, what was available. Uh, uh, this was, these were fairly cheap cuts. This was flanken, if you know the word, which is basically short ribs. Uh, that was a fairly cheap cut. That was the one that went from 12 cents to 18 cents a pound. There were more expensive cuts as well that went even higher, but that wasn't what the strike was about. I mean, the people who could afford that weren't going to have trouble buying meat. Um, but uh, the, uh, if I, I wanted to call it the Great Flunken War, but uh, you, know, you can't get away with that today because half the people wouldn't understand what the word meant. That's great. Um, what happened to the women who were arrested for striking is uh, another viewer uh, wants to. Well, there was, um, <clears throat> they went before a magistrate and um, he, uh, he had, you know, dozens of them come before him in one day. And you could tell he was getting angrier and angrier at them as the day went on because the fines got bigger. First, it was $5 and then, and then it was $10, which again was a whole week's pay. So it wasn't, it wasn't an insignificant sure. amount of money. And he would lecture the women about how they knew nothing about the kosher meat industry. And there were a couple of examples in the book where the women just answered him right back. There was one line I loved. It was like, why did you take the meat from that woman? And the answer was, what then? I should just stand there and look it in the teeth? You know, they would just give right back to the judge. They were not cowed by this because again, their backs were against the wall. They knew they were right. They felt they had a right to, to eat kosher meat and that uh, this was being denied them. Um, but the, uh, the uh, anyway, they went before a magistrate. He um, occasionally would threaten to send them off really to, uh, there was an island, I think, in the East River where they, uh, where they uh, it was like a work camp. But mostly it was a fine. And a lot of the women, several of them who couldn't pay the fine, they went to jail. And they had to spend some nights, some time in jail, occasionally leaving children unattended in the, in the home. In fact, one night, several of the men folk went to the police station and threatened to uh, break in and, and, and free their wives because they were so upset about it. They just didn't think that it was appropriate to treat women in this way, nor was it appropriate for, for the police to be beating them up with sticks. But here again, the women gave back as good as they, as, as they got. People threw garbage out the windows, old shoes. Some, uh, one policeman got slapped with a piece of liver. 
I mean, there were some great stories here. Yeah, those are, um, you know, all really helped to tell, uh, sort of bring, bring, bring what it, you know, what it was like um, uh, to, to be there on the ground to life. So I think, yeah, that's, that, those are that the things. The and, yeah, really good, uh, good sort of um, eyewitness account and in, in some ways come out of some of those, uh, some of those sources. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the kosher meat cooperative that one of the women, women uh, yeah. strikers set up? There were actually two of them um, that, that show up in the book. Um, this was one of the solutions that was discussed. It actually had been discussed way before the kosher meat boycott, whether they should form some form of co-op where like five butchers might be selling on one street if they all came together, formed one corporation, and they all took salaries, you know, they would save money on overhead and things like that. But it took the boycott for anybody to really do it. And Sarah Edelson did it, and so did Sarah Cohn. Right. Uh, they both did. And she explained in great detail, it's in the book, about how she, how she bought the fixtures and how she, um, she managed to get a really good price out of the wholesalers because she bought so much at the same time. And the first day she opened up, um, she ran out of meat at 11 a.m., because she was able to, because it was a co-op, she could undersell the, the profit-making butchers who were not happy about this at all. And this was supposed to be the model for the future, but it turned out not to be because after the strike was over and the prices basically went down, went back where they were, there wasn't much of a call for co-ops anymore. And so the vision of setting up hundreds of them essentially um, uh, fizzled. And these two co-ops um, were not mentioned in the press again. I did some, just some uh, research in the city directories and they, there seems to have been butcher shops at those addresses for two or three more years and then nothing. So I think it just fizzled itself. Right, right. right. You, you know, one of the things um, that uh, I think um, often um, doesn't, doesn't quite come through in the telling of this uh, story, and I, I wanted to hear, um, you know, you touch on this a little bit uh, more, is in, in certain um, points in your talk, you touched on this, um, but, you know, in this story, you sort of have the two poles of the, uh, the meat trusts and the, um, uh, and the women uh, boycotting. And, you know, I think, um, could you tell us a little bit more about how the, uh, the, the, the butchers themselves, the retail butchers experienced, experienced this? You know, what, what was it like to be uh, the Luscards who incidentally, um, uh, it's the old man in the photo. Those were the kids in the photo that, uh, oh, not right. Israel, but, well, <laughs> we'll we'll g let, give you a pass on that one here. But anyway, the yeah, guy with so the, you know, butchers, what was it like? the guy with the apron, that was him, right? The guy with the apron. Right? Yep, the old, the old man with the beard. But uh, yeah, what was it like for the Lust Gardens on, on that day in May of 1902? Or what was that experience might have been like for folks like them? The butchers were between a rock and a hard place here. They really were. They saw the problem coming. They didn't want to have to pass those prices on to the women. But of course, they didn't have any choice. They, they, they couldn't make any kind of a profit if they didn't do it. And increasingly, watching the women get beaten up in the streets mm -hmm. and thinking that they were the villains when they really were more, um, they were victims really as much as the women were, it didn't sit well with them at all. And eventually, um, some of them broke away from the organization. Um, they, they had a central organization that was representing them, broke away and said, this is ridiculous. We need to support the women. We need to close, you know, until this until this is over. This is this is silly, because um, you know um, women had a um, special relationship with their butchers uh, in those days. Most women bought from the butcher that was near them on the block. But um, first of all, they had to trust that the meat was kosher, and that was not always the case, even by butchers who had signs in their in their windows that said kosher meat, which meant that the the, women, the butchers had to be themselves observant. They probably had to have some kind of a synagogue membership so people understood that. But they also needed to be trust on both sides of that relationship because um, most people bought on credit. Um, right. They'd pay at the end of the week when the husband brought the money back. And so um, the butchers, the women needed to trust their butchers and the butchers needed to trust the women. So this was devastating for a lot of these butchers that somehow they were public enemy number one for really what they felt was no fault of their own. And the women made some ridiculous claims, like the women, the butchers are dripping in diamonds, you know, as we as we suffer. And of course, most of the butchers weren't dripping with diamonds; they were suffering too. And the very fact that, and the proof of it is that even over the course of several weeks of this, 
many of them had to close their shops permanently. They didn't have a lot of money in reserve to basically get them through this. So they really weren't dripping with diamonds. Right, the Lust Gardens closed, uh, family closed their butcher shop at 97 Orchard yeah. in the, in the after It didn't reopen that. after this, huh? This. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some evidence at a different location uh, for a mm -hmm. small amount of time, but it's it's unclear like much of, um, you know, this this kind of uh, research and some of the sources suggest. I think we have time for one more question, um, perhaps. So this one I think is a really interesting question. Uh, one of our viewers is asking, is there any evidence of how uh, women, uh, these women change their diets or cooking habits or recipes while the kosher meat was absent or less present from their kitchens during this, this period of the boycott or the strike? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they went to other forms of protein. Uh, eggs and um, uh, chicken was actually more expensive than beef. So chicken wasn't much of an option, but they went to eggs. Um, and in fact, at one point, the trust was so nefarious that they actually arranged for prices of things like chicken and eggs to go up. They stockpiled eggs. And the reason they were able to do it was that a lot of, they, they really had the um, railroads where they needed them. And if they put pressure on the railroads, um, they could get whatever they wanted. So they were able to um, uh, exert pressure even in areas of food that they didn't um, control. But there's also a scene in the book where Carolyn Schatzberg um, walks out on the street and sees a bunch of women um, um, picketing and, and, and makes a speech. She basically says, you know, you don't understand how good fish can be when it's prepared properly. If you come up to my apartment, let me show you how to prepare fish so it tastes better than meat. And she brought a whole lot of women up to do that. <clears throat> There's one that's, other scene uh, in the book that, that, that this great. brings to mind, which is the cholent pots. Cholent is a, um, is a stew that was actually a sort of a solution to the problem of, on the one hand, not, being, not, not kindling fire on the Sabbath, but also it being a joy to have a hot meal on the Sabbath. And people would throw anything in the pot. They had meat and potatoes and onions and barley and things. And either they would keep them on the top of their stove um, keep it warm. It's kind of like slow cooking, only 1902 style. Or they would go to the bakers where the challah had been baked, and they would bring their cholin pots. And then in the middle of the Sabbath, they would go and pick them up and bring them so they have a hot meal. Well, there's one scene in the book where women break into a bakery and open up the cholin pots. And if they see one with meat in it, they throw out the contents of it. They also, mm -hmm. there was also a debate about what to do about the delis. Um, they had a special meeting about the delis and they finally decided, no, meat is meat and we're going to go after the delicatessens as well. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think all those really rich um, anecdotes help uh, help bring they help, they help the bring this. Yeah. yeah, help bring the story to uh, to, you know, really give it good. Um, Good texture. And um, so what you, did most of those anecdotes come from uh, newspaper accounts or what were, yeah, what were some of your sources? Yeah. For? I didn't find many accounts in the, in the way of uh, memoirs or anything like that. Sure. Or family histories. It was not there. Um, newspapers. And um, some of the best stories were in the Yiddish papers, um, but not all of them. You, you, you got them in both of them as well. They did um, in-depth interviews with Sarah Edelson and Carolyn Chatsburg. So we learned a lot about them and their families and stuff too. But um, I just picked up the, the anecdotes where I could find them. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more quick uh, question here. And, um, you know, I think you touched on this, but it, uh, a little bit in the, in the talk, but, you know, one viewer is, um, you know, asking a little bit about the, uh, you know, the sort of different um, experiences of uh, Russian or East European Jewish women and, and German women um, in this uh, in this in this particular uh, event um, of the the strike and the situation uh, and what background uh, what, how those different backgrounds might have shaped uh, their experiences of well there was not a lot in the book about German women most of the Germans in the book are the men folk the ones who ran the enterprises mm -hmm. and things like that um, all I can tell you is that the stories I think that we've all read about this are really kind of true. You know, if the uh, if if the if the Russians went uptown and uh, went to Temple Emmanuel and, uh, and 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 looked at what was going on there, and they saw men and women sitting together, and they saw men without um, uh, yarmulkes on, and God forbid, an organ uh, during Sabbath services, they thought they were in a church. You know, it really didn't look to them like anything that felt like Judaism to them. 
Um, and so these were these were people that they did not understand and, and, and didn't like very much because on the one hand they claimed to be Jewish but they sure didn't act it as far as the Russians and the Eastern Europeans were concerned. Then you look on the other side, you look at the German view and they looked at the Russians as horrible embarrassments. These people were unassimilable as far as they were concerned. They didn't seem to want to assimilate in a lot of cases. They didn't come to America to become American. They came to America to you know, flee persecution and they just wanted to live the same lives that they had lived in Eastern Europe. And so, um, and, and also the, I think that there was a feeling on the part of a lot of the German Jews that their own acceptance by Gentile New York was somewhat um, uh, flimsy and that these people being identified with them were horrible embarrassments and might mm. actually, actually um, uh, undermine that. So there was really not a lot of love lost here, but yet the German Jews felt it was their duty to help the, 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 the Lower East Side Jews it was more like, don't come to our synagogues, we'll help you build your own. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, um, but, it, but nonetheless, I mean, the, the settlement houses that they set up and stuff, there really was, a, I think, a genuine effort to try to Americanize the people that they could. It doesn't really answer your question because I don't know very much about the German Jewish women per se. Mm. That's kind of what I've got to say on the subject. <laughs> Maybe you'll leave that for the next, uh, next you book. know, um, next book, next topic. Well, um, that, uh, that, um, takes us uh, to the end of our, our talk this evening. I want to uh, thank you again, Scott, for joining us this evening and, and giving us a, a, a sense of um, this really incredible uh, story. Um, to our viewers, we want to thank you again for tuning in and being with us this evening. We hope you stay tuned for future Tenement Museum virtual events. Uh, by signing up for our newsletter. Uh, please, of course, consider donating to the museum. We hope to see you next time. Take care and good night. Thanks again, Scott. Hope to night. see you My pleasure. in real life at some point soon. All right, take care.